know, my latest trial that I just submitted for funding to uh, CIHR was to look at collaborative care in primary care settings. So when mothers go to, to take their children in for the well baby visits, that we should be screening all moms or case identification during that time period. And any mother that has a score greater than nine on the Edinburgh will talk about that. Um, I think that that's when we need to follow these mothers with a depression care manager who can be a nurse. And we have coordinated care where we follow up with the mothers to make sure there's treatment initiation and um, adherence and follow her to remission but we'll talk about that but that's in a nutshell what we need to do so we can just go have coffee now <laughs> but but okay so let me just finish up uh, talking a little bit here about dads um, so let's see. Um, so we're talking about the attachment so that we know that if a father has depression, he has a decreased father infant attachment um, and it impacts their interaction. We know that there's increased hostility in that interaction, decreased bonding, and de decreased or increased parent child dysfunction. There's been studies showing that father's depression during those first six months postpartum leads to uh, child internalizing and externalizing behavioral problems at two to three years. There's a longitudinal study conducted in um, the UK. Have you heard of the Avon study? You may have heard of it. This is a longitudinal uh, UK uh, population-based study, and we've shown paternal depression to be linked to child outcomes at three and a half years and up to seven years. So we're following these the child's exposure to parental depression and we're following it longitudinally and the longest we followed it now is to seven years. But we know, so what we're seeing is that exposure to either mother or fathers being depressed early in the um, child's life can lead to long-term uh, developmental, poor developmental trajectories. We think that postpartum depression in either the mother or the father leads to a very stressful home environment. If the father is depressed versus non-depressed fathers, they're more likely to report decreased marital satisfaction, affection, and cohesion, decreased confidence in the future success of the relationship, increased criticism towards the partner, so towards the mother, increased parenting stress, and decreased satisfaction in friendship. So it's impacting not just the nuclear family, but it's impacting the social environment that the father lives in as well. And then I'd like to mention a new term. It's called dual parental depression. I coined this term because I couldn't find it in the literature. But there's a, a substantial number of families out there where either the mother or the father is depressed. And what we're looking at is dual parental depression where both mother and father are depressed. The percentage of families in where at least one parent is experiencing postpartum depression is high. We think one in um, five, one in four families will have um, one parent being depressed. A paternal um, postpartum depression systematic review found when there's depression in one partner, it's significantly correlated to depression in another partner, in the other partner. Unfortunately, little is known about this dual parental postpartum depression. One Canadian study showed that if a mother was diagnosed with a psychiatric, a psychiatric condition at two to six months, it's okay. Um, we know that a quarter of the fathers were also diagnosed with a psychiatric problem as well. So if the mother was diagnosed, a quarter of the fathers were also diagnosed. It has been hypothesized that dual parental postpartum depression has an additive effect on infants, placing them at even higher risk for adverse outcomes than those who are exposed to only one depressed parent. And so that's why we're conducting this study that was just recently funded. Um, I'm the principal investigator. It's called the IMPACT study. Some of you will hear about this study because so you'll be um, potentially participating in it or some of your clients will be. It's a longitudinal study of new parents in Ontario. I'm going to recruit over 4,200 mothers and fathers um, across the GTA area from hospitals. In hospital, we're going to go in. We're going to have recruitment nurses, and we're going to recruit these mothers right um, at the, at, you know, in the immediate postpartum period because research suggests that's the best way to recruit fathers. Actually, that's where we can reliably find dads <laughs> is on the postpartum floor, 
And the objective of this uh, huge study, this study um, is uh, $1.35 million to do this, is to examine the impact of parental depression in the first two years of a child's life. And what we're going to do is focus on understanding the mechanisms whereby single um, postpartum depression, so the mother only depressed or the father only depressed, versus dual postpartum depression, where both mother and father are depressed and how this impacts child development up to two years. And we're going to be using structural equation modeling. So this will be causal data. This will not be associations or relationships. So we will be able to, we're going to divide the families into four different risk groups at one year postpartum. So neither mom or dad were depressed. That's one family group. And another family group is mom only depressed. Dad was not depressed. The other group is dad only depressed mom not depressed and then the other family group is both mom and dad were depressed and we're going to go we're going to be testing this theoretical model now I know you can't really see it but we're going to be focusing on these depressed parents and we're going to have moderators such as how much um, interaction the parent has with the child whether there's comorbidities such as anxiety or substance abuse um, then we're going to look at infant temperament. We're also going to look at infant gender because the research is suggesting, as I've said in a couple times, is that fathers or little boys seem to be impacted more than little girls. And then we're going to be looking at two different mechanisms. There's four mechanisms here that impact child developmental trajectories. First, there's the genetic disposition. We can't alter that, right? You, your genes are your genes, and you know this is what you you were born with. Then there's the in utero environment. So the environment that you were, the baby was, you know, developed in, and you know the levels of cortisol that they were exposed to. If the mother was experiencing high levels of stress and you know nutritional patterns and such, and then we have postnatally. These are mechanisms that we can modify. It's mothers or fathers, um, negative cognitions and behaviors. So we're going to be assessing that. So that's their parenting behaviors, their cognitions, how much satisfaction they derive from caring for the children, how they perceive their parenting role. And then we're going to be looking at the home environment. So we're going to be assessing for intimate partner violence. We're going to be assessing for parenting stress and the marital relationship, satisfaction, high levels of conflict. So these are different mechanisms that we're going to be looking at. And we've got all these different developmental outcomes following the child to two years. And we're going to be assessing these parents every three months throughout the first year postpartum, and then every six months the final year. So we're going to have very detailed data to say that if you've got a family where the dad's depressed, these are the mechanisms that link to poor child developmental outcomes, and this is what you need to do with this family to promote proper child development. Is that not a great study? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's five years. So I'll come back in five years <laughs> and present the results to that study. <laughs> okay. So I really want to highlight here, this is the summary slide related to this section, that international experts have clearly identified parental depression as a major childhood adversity and that effective interventions to address this condition are one of the most important public health preventative strategies we can implement to reduce the long-term negative developmental outcomes among children. Okay? Addressing parental depression is a preventative strategy for child development. It's so important. So now that we've talked about why we need to be targeting this condition, I think what I'd like to do is now present some slides on how do we properly identify what's the best evidence. So it often goes undetected, and we know that the reasons why it goes undetected are um, multifactorial. Often the barriers are related to maternal or professional factors. Maternal barriers, mothers often lack knowledge about postpartum depression. I think mothers are becoming more informed about postpartum depression now through um, you know these types of forums and such. And you know, mothers, they don't call it postpartum depression by the way. They say, I experience postpartum. They never say depression. I'm, I'm a, I have young children, so I'm interacting with mothers always on a social level as well. They say, I think I experienced postpartum. And, but they stop there. So it's really neat how they're conceptualizing it. But you know what's interesting? 10 years ago, a mother would never come up to me and say that she experienced postpartum. Now, mothers come up to me all the time 
and say that they experience postpartum. So we are doing a great job with decreasing the stigma of it. We are normalizing it. We're saying lots of mothers experience this and it's okay. <coughs> And so what we need to do is make sure that they get to treatment. But there's still some detection barriers related to the mother. They often minimize their symptoms. They think that what they're experiencing is normal. All mothers experience this. And if you weren't sleeping at night, you'd be experiencing this too. Right? So they minimize their symptoms. So some mothers, you will offer them treatment. Even when I try to recruit these clinically depressed moms into my trials, they'll say, I'm not experiencing depression. No, I don't want to participate in your trial. And they refuse. You know, free treatment. Conversely, some mothers do recognize that they're experiencing postpartum depression, but they don't know where to obtain assistance. They're unwilling or to disclose emotional problems, especially depression. They perceive that a healthcare professional's role is to focus on physical issues rather than emotional issues. The emotional issues are to be kept within the family. And you'll see that that's very particular among certain cultures as well, whereas saying that you have a mental illness is a black mark on the family as a whole, and in some cultures it's grounds for divorce. So what's the likelihood of the mother disclosing that she has experiencing postpartum depression if she's living in that context? It's very challenging. So mothers will often have somatization, certain cultural groups that do this more often than not, but they'll be complaining of a headache, a stomach ache, GI problems, their back is hurting. So they'll translate it into physical symptoms. Many mothers also fear having their children taken away. I can't tell you how often I see this in the literature as to why women will not seek treatment or they will refuse treatment. They're afraid to have their children taken away. And they often mention Children's Aid Society. And you know, I think that there's a lot of myths around Children's Aid Society. And I think we need a whole public health campaign around that. Because you know, Children's Aid Society is there to assist families and to support families, not to take children away from families. But parents perceive this.